Hey guys, Alex from Central Florida Enthusiast, and today we're going to be resuming our series on the history of roller coasters. Today is part two. We're going to be diving into the ultimate legacy of Arrow and a period that I like to call the coaster renaissance. So let's go. All right, so we got to first go back to the 1950s when Walt Disney opened up Disneyland. Um, basically, parks back then were very sketchy. Uh, safety was not high priority, or at least that was the general perception. Um, it was not family friendly. And when someone said, uh, when Walt Disney said, I want to build a theme park, someone actually said, why would you want to build one of those? Um, and at the time that made perfect sense to say uh, little did they know he would change the world as we know well around the same time um, actually shortly after World War II uh, there were there were three friends um, I believe um, DH Morgan uh, I forgot the other two unfortunately but um, I know, uh, well, I think it's Morgan was there, it was his company. Morgan, um, Dean Morgan, I believe. Uh, those were some of the founding um, members of Arrow. And they pretty much took to build anything they could. Um, not just strictly amusement, but like anything they could. Uh, they wanted to start a manufacturing business. And um, Walt saw their quality products that they were making. They were very well engineered uh, products and Walt wanted in. So he ordered a few from them and he, um, he really liked how they would stick around until the job was done. If you know anything about Disney, their opening day was a nightmare and actually um, the uh, fr uh, frog hopper or the, well, or, or the flying Dumbo ride. Um, it, it had like a hydraulic cylinder, and um, when uh, people uh, tried to move it up, uh, they would overload it because there was actually too much weight. Because Aero designed the mechanics of it. But Walt, Di uh, but Disney built the the flying Dumbo's essentially, and uh, they didn't. I guess they didn't collaborate well enough because the the Dumbo elephant ended up being way too heavy, um, and it just overloaded everything. And then you put gas in there, and uh, and essentially the tank that held all the uh, hydraulic fluid. They would literally have to skim off the surface uh, every single ride, and um, but they stuck there, stuck to there uh, until that until the job was done, until the ride was working properly. Um, that's something like you don't really see too often today. Like yes, you do see manufacturers working with the part, but you don't see them like staying in town until the ride is working again or working properly so Bolt was very impressed by that and saw like okay these guys were dedicated to making my opening day a success I owe part of my success to them so Walt wanted to work with them um, and at, during this time he was actually filming a movie in the uh, Swiss Alps and he, uh, there is, um, and this will be important in a second, most of you can probably understand why, but, um, well, uh, there is, uh, they had the, uh, sky gondolas, um, and going over the park, and there was this one part, one part of the park, where there was a hill, and teenagers would go there to make out. And, well, Walt didn't really want a makeup spot in his family-friendly park. It wasn't exactly family-friendly. Um, so, he wanted to put a ride there. 
plus also the, the uh, there was this guy got a lot of support. It wasn't exactly that pretty to look at. Um, so he really wanted to take that out but keep the sky ride. So while he was thinking about that movie, they were just filming, and he was thinking about a particular mountain. Um, everyone watching this probably already knows what mountain. And that was the Matterhorn. And Walt pretty much said, I want to build an attraction that is a mountain, and I want to simulate going uh, skiing down or bobsledding down a mountain. Right now, the only technology that we have that we can do this is roller coasters. Uh, um, because he originally wanted it to just basically actually be very similar to the old Russian mountain, which was a slide, like an ice slide, that you, you actually bobsled down. Um, but Walt wanted a coaster, and he didn't want it wood because wood was a little bit too loud. Um, he wanted it to be quiet, and he wanted it to be smooth. Um, I can't really say that today about the Nine Horn, but back then it was. And so, the, uh, so he takes this and he ta and sends it to Arrow and says, what can you come up with? Um, here's what I want it to do. I want it to have very tight turns. Um, and they basically, came back and they, they looked and thought, well, it, he wanted steel. Well, steel track is basically box track. And you take box track and you put it into a bend, or you try to bend it, it buckles and it becomes out of, out of context essentially. Um, not good, very rough, if not potentially derails obviously. Uh, that's not good. Um, so, one of the guys in the shop thought, what if we use a pipe? A pipe will stay at the same diameter, um, and it won't buckle. Um, it won't buckle until, like, you're at, like, a 88-degree bend, um, on one particular point like it, it, it's so when they pre uh, debuted the Matterhorn bobsled ride that became the first roller coaster to feature tubular steel track which is incredibly instrumental to today's industry um, the, in terms of modern co coasters, this is the most important, um, without a doubt. Uh, we would not have any of these coasters um, if it wasn't for this. Sure, maybe someone else might have, but because of this, this laid the groundwork for everything else. So it is hands down the most important roller coaster in existence right now. Um, unless someone just comes up with some crazy sort of track type that becomes a s industry standard that everything is based off of, um, yeah, I don't, I don't see it. I mean, maybe RMC, but that's more of a flashback to old school style. So, because, um, well, like I said, track used to be box track or well, essentially I-beams, which is essentially what RMC has. So uh, RMC is actually realistically a return to form, uh, to be entirely honest. And of course, not to say RMC isn't revolutionary because the way that they're designing it is very modern. Um, it's just steel box track in and of itself is nothing revolutionary. Um, I mean, even even EF Miller has steel uh, I beam track, um, but love the ride so. And if you remember from Wednesday's video, 
when we talked about the flip flap, uh, flip flap railway, which was one of the very first attempts at going upside down. Those rides only lasted a year or two, or they did not last long. And no one tried to attempt it since that point. So Arrow, high off of their success from their mine trains, and high off of the success of Tubular Steel Track, they, just, they thought, well, hey, we have this new groundbreaking technology. Let's try going upside down again. This might just be the craziest idea anyone's ever came up with at that time. Uh, because, well, last time people tried going upside down on a coaster, people got, <laughs> people got hurt. People got seriously hurt. Um, so it was quite an insane idea back then to actually take a roller coaster and put it upside down. Um, it was a very foreign concept to people back then. And it was why it was such a big deal. So Knoxbury Farm, they were the first person to take uh, take the uh, bid and said, all right, I heard you want to go upside down. Give us, uh, give us what you got. So Arrow, uh, Ron Toomer, he was the designer of Corkscrew. He decided, um, him and a few others, uh, thought, well, hey, because the last time we tried to, uh, people tried to go upside down on a roller coaster, it was one, the loop was way too circular. Um, they were, they were not, they were not designed for, they were designed to have like the maximum amount of G-forces on, on an object at all moments versus, um, what is now the teardrop loop, um, that was, um, that was actually a Schwarzkopf design. Uh, we'll get to that in a second, but um, Dean, uh, Dean Morgan, uh, Ron Toomer thought, well, what if we take the loop, the circular loop, and we stretch it out like a uh, corkscrew, and we can call it a corks uh, the corkscrew, the arrow corkscrew model. And that's exactly what they did. Um, so, they opened up at Knoxbury Farm the very first inverting roller coaster um, to safely invert people upside down, or as most people call it, the first modern coaster to go upside down. And what that ultimately means is it sends people upside down safely. And actually, um, funny story. When uh, the actual model that went to Knoxbury Farm, that uh, that was the actual prototype that that Ron Toomer and Dean Morgan actually uh, rode in. Because back then, like when you came out with a new concept, you had to create a working prototype. You see that sometimes with some manufacturers, like I know RMC did it with the Raptors. Um, and I believe Mock did it with their invo uh, inverted powered coaster. But um, back then, like you had to actually, like you had to uh, build it just to see if it works. Uh, there was no um, computer aided design or CAD. There was nothing, none of that. I mean, coasters back then were designed with a piece of bendable wire and bam there's your shape and when Ron Toomer and Dean Morgan um, actually were testing the prototype um, they tested a few times with sandbags and the, the restraints were actually um, the restraints were just race car harnesses from um, one of the engineers' car or something like that. Um, 
and the um, the sandbags actually, I believe they actually came flying out. And they're like, all right, the sandbags came out. Who's getting on? <laughs> and Ron Toomer, Dean Morgan were like, hey, right, I'll get on. And yeah, they they were the first people to to ride an inverting steel roll. Uh, uh, they were the first two people to ride a modern looping coaster. And for anyone who wants to ride Corkscrew, well, unfortunately, it's no no longer operating at Knoxbury Farm. Um, fortunately, it still is in operation. And fortunately for most people in my audience being from America, it's here in America. Um, it's at Silverwood. Uh, ironically enough, the same exact name. Um, so... You still write this piece of history. So, a little while after this, a man by the name of Anton Schwarzkopf decided, hey, let's let's actually tackle the vertical loop. So, he did. And they actually built um, the revolution at Six Flags Magic Mountain. And that actually, um, a lot of people say, oh, it was the first modern looping coaster. Technically, in a way, you're right. Like, yes, loop, a vertical loop. Yes, it is the first modern vertical loop. Um, but it's a lot of people mistake it for the first inverting roller, uh, first modern roller coaster to go upside down. That it, that is not true. Um, corkscrew at uh, Knoxbury Farm was the first. But um, that's sort of irrelevant um, because also um, it was a little bit of a race to see who could open uh, their new additions first. So um, because Magic Mountain this is in Southern, Southern California, the weather there's perfect. Pretty much like they don't really have to they didn't really have to take a break during the off season uh, because of weather. I mean, the weather is nice there all the time. Um, versus Cedar Point, it gets stupid cold up there. Uh, I mean, they're on Lake Erie. Uh, I mean, for goodness sake, like part of the lake freezes over. I mean, yeah, that's not good conditions to be pouring concrete or um, welding doesn't matter. Um, you can still weld in those temperatures, although it, it probably be very hard to, um, just keeping moisture off of everything. It's, it does not make for a good, uh, work environment. So obviously Cedar Point was very limited on that. And if they were not, if Cedar Point was in a better city, um, than Sandusky, <laughs> then yeah, this Corkscrew would have been the first looping roller coaster, but Magic Mountain beat them by like a month or two. Um, it really came down to who sees first. Um, and then, of course, uh, Corkscrew at Cedar Point, that opened, and uh, that became the first coaster to go upside down three times. Um, and yes, uh, Coaster Studios parody on Revolution is accurate. At least they have the. Uh, at least Magic Mountain has the better ride. I hate Corkscrew at Cedar Point. Those restraints suck. I don't mind roughness. Those restraints are not fat person friendly, especially with the stupid seatbelts Cedar Fair makes them put on these arrows. They don't need them. Well, when. When uh, Cedar Point built Corkscrew, uh, everyone wanted everyone wanted one. Everyone wanted an arrow. Um, at this point, Cedar Point had invented two-liter steel track. Uh, they invented the Corkscrew and gave the rebirth to modern looping coasters. Um, and everyone was buying them up. They also uh, invented the log flume. Um, so, during this time, they saw very rapid growth, and when, um, 
when they wanted to build rides in Europe for cheaper, they went to a Dutch um, manufacturer, you might know them as Vacoma, and made an agreement, you manufacture our track in Europe for the European market. You can s sell our coasters in Europe, but we get the design from it, we get the money from it. Uh, we get some of the money. We'll split the cost. Um, and that would be a way to help them save money on shipping. So Vacoma did that a few times. And then they pretty much took that track. They redesigned it a little bit to make it different enough to where they don't violate patents. And they pretty much just sold that for themselves. And that was a devastating blow to Aero. Uh, I mean, they had given them their entire, like, like, trade secrets away to them. And they stole it. And, uh, I believe at this point they, they filed bankruptcy, actually. And when uh, the new Aero that came back uh, was known as uh, Aerodynamics. And um, they were desperate to make a name for themselves. So by the late 80s, Cedar Point, they wanted a coaster. And they went to Aero, as they did with many other models uh, that they have. Um, they, they got Iron Dragon. They got Corkscrew. Uh, they got uh, Gemini, which actually was Ron Toomer's favorite ride. Uh, it, was, it was his most favorite ride he had ever built. And I completely understand why. I love that ride so much. It is just such a fun little attraction. I mean, it's nothing intense. The airtime's pretty good. Uh, it is glossy smooth. And I, I love that ride. And then, and then when you get some friends on the other train, you pl uh, play Money Train. Oh, forget about it. That is just... I could do that all day. Uh, yeah. I completely understand why that was Ron Toomer's favorite attraction. Um, but uh, Ron Toomer, during this time period, he saw rides in Japan. Uh, most specifically a ride called Bandit at, um, in, in Japan and um, he saw that it was really really tall and uh, he saw that it was really really fast and it had a lot of airtime on it and there, it didn't go upside down it was just all about the airtime so Ryan really wanted to build this attraction at Cedar Point and Cedar Point pretty much came back and said can you make it 205 feet tall and can we call it a, a hyper coaster so in 1989 Aerodynamics and Cedar Point had built the world's first hyper coaster and this actually sparked something very important in the industry this was the spark that turned the coaster wars on but that is for monday's video anyways guys thank you so much for watching this is alex from central florida enthusiasts uh, please consider subscribing if you haven't already and if you already are hit that bell notifi uh, notification so you can stay up to date with everything that we do uh, give us a comment, give us a like, let us know what you think. Um, anyways, uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, stay tuned for Monday's video. Um, it won't disappoint. Um, anyways, guys, this is Alex from Central Florida Enthusiasts checking out. Bye.